from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Mary Jane Deeb, Chief of the Division of the African and Middle East Division. And that's a division that's responsible for 78 countries uh, in, in Africa, uh, in the Near East, in the Caucasus, Central Asia, uh, Georgia and Armenia. And of course we have the Hebraic section uh, as well that covers Hebraica and Judaica throughout the world. Last year, the African Middle East Division's Africa section, in partnership with the Poetry and Literature Center and the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa, launched a new series called Conversations with African Poets and Writers. The series consists of a set of live webcast interviews with established and emerging poets, short story writers, novelists, and playwrights from the African continent and the African diaspora. Programs include readings and moderated discussion led by staff in the African section of the library's African Middle East Division. And we've had some absolutely wonderful people. We've had Ali Mazrui, we have Keora Petsi, Kego Sitzil, the poet laureate of South Africa. We had Donato Nodongo, one of the most important writers from the uh, Republic, of, uh, Republic of Guinea. We had Helen Habila, an award-winning Nigerian writer who teaches at George Mason University. And earlier we had uh, Chinua Achebe. We also have another uh, program on Friday to which you're all invited. And um, this is with uh, Tijan Salah. And he's from Gambia, a wonderful uh, writer. And um, he will also be reading from his works and um, be interviewed by uh, Angel Batiste. So today uh, we're going to have a young and emerging writer, a woman, paint, a woman poet, uh, who will be speaking with us. And uh, first of all, to in introduce our partners, here is Rob Casper head of the Poetry and Literature uh, Center at the Library of Congress, who's been very supportive and uh, very much part of this initiative. And he will introduce the next speaker. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, thanks to Mary Jane. Uh, as she said, I'm Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center at the Library of Congress. Uh, and, and in the past year, uh, the center has joined forces with a do dozen different library divisions and centers to promote literature. Uh, none of these partnerships are more part important than the partnership that we have with the African and Middle Eastern Division uh, and with the Africa Society on the National Summit of the National Summit on Africa. Uh, in promoting this series conversations with African poets and writers. Uh, we started this series a year ago, and we are very proud of the writers who have come here to represent and celebrate literature from across the African continent. And Mary Jane talked a little bit about some of the highlights from the past year. Uh, we are thrilled to launch uh, this year's series with poet and performer Anna Malago, and as Mary Jane said, just two days from now at noon, you can come here and hear Gambian poet Tijan Sala as well. If you want to find out more about this series um, and about the literary events that we do here at the Library of Congress, uh, you can go check out our website, www.loc.gov slash poetry. Uh, you can also find out more about the African and Middle Eastern uh, Division uh, at their reading room website, which is www.loc.gov slash rr slash Ahmed, A-M-E-D. And uh, finally, if you want to go see the uh, webcasts of last year's events, which were really wonderful and um, various, uh, you can go to uh, loc.gov and click on webcasts. And under literature, poetry and literature, you'll find um, uh, our uh, series from last year. 
So uh, the African and Middle Eastern Division and uh, the Poetry and Literature Center could not uh, run this series uh, and bring such wonderful writers without the help of um, our outside partner, the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa. And uh, finally, let me introduce Bernadette Paolo to talk a little bit about uh, the Africa Society and introduce uh, today's reader. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests all. Thank you, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb, Dr. Robert Casper, Dr. Angel Batiste, Ms. Eve Ferguson, uh, Laverne Page, everyone who's associated with the Library of Congress. You know we're launching a global campaign to highlight the academic achievements and literary contributions of African writers and poets. And this has not only continued in 2012, but it's flourished. The Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa is so pleased to partner with the African section of the African and Middle East Division and the Poetry and Literature section of the Library of Congress. I worked on Capitol Hill, and we always relied on the Library of Congress. And so to be in this library is really an honor for all of us for all of the treasures that you house, and to bring people here, many of whom are unknown um, to people sitting here and millions of others who will see this presentation is really something that we look forward to. We could not have selected a better, more meaningful day than today, Wednesday, November 7th, for this program featuring a dynamic, young, extraordinarily talented poet, author, and performer from Kenya. This is the day after President Barack Hussein Obama, whose father was from Kenya, was reelected as President of the United States. This is the day when we were again reminded of the continent of Africa's contribution to our country into the world in all realms. I have the honor today of introducing Anna Milagro. I first met her at a program we did on Capitol Hill, Africa Day, where she brought an audience of over 500 people to their feet, including members of Congress. She is a force of nature. Born and raised in Kenya, East Africa, Anna began performing at the tender age of eight. She is a truly remarkable Renaissance woman, an internationally recognized poet, spoken word artist, singer, songwriter, actress, storyteller, and dancer. She has a three-page resume, which I cannot uh, go through, but you will know who she is after you hear her. She has won numerous national awards in her native Kenya and here in the United States. I'm just going to give you a flavor of who she's entertained before in our country in a moment. She is referred to as the queen of spoken Afrobeat and also Mama Africa. I have to dispute the Mama Africa title because she's not old enough. She is, in fact, the youngest performer that we have. Uh, you'll grow into Mama Africa. Uh, she has captivated uh, many with her blend of spoken word, songs, acting, dance, and storytelling into an electrifying one-woman show. And she evokes emotion and passion in those who listen to her along with thought. Her music, she's a musician, has a unique message from the soul of the motherland, and it tells the story of life's rough but fulfilling journeys. Since the launch of her career in the United States, she's become one of the most sought after African spoken Afrobeat artists. Now let's have a moment of truth in this audience. How many of you are familiar with Afrobeat? Oh, I'm surprised. That's very good. So you're not performing, Anna, in front of people who don't know your particular talent. Um, 
She is also has, has, has spoken before our president, President Barack Obama. She's spoken before people <laughs> such as the late Wangari Mathai and Professor Henry Louis Gates. And she's graced the stages of the Kennedy Center, the World Bank, the U.S. Army Materi uh, the Material Command, America's 400th anniversary of the Material Command, UNAIDS, I'm sorry, 400th anniversary, and the Embassy of Kenya, and many other venues. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Anna Malagro. Anna? Oh, thank you so much, and uh, thank you, Bernadette, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mary Jane Adib. Thank you so much, everyone, for having me here. Um, I am so honored to be here today. Um, I have always been a performer, but I never thought I'd have time one day to come and actually perform at, at the Library of Congress. And uh, they have asked me to start first with my poems before we go to the interview. And also, I just want to thank the Embassy of Kenya for sending their representative here today uh, to celebrate their own. I'm celebrating them, and they are also celebrating me because we actually uh, support each other in many ways than one. So I want to thank God for this day. I want to thank my mother-in-law and my husband who's over there. I want to thank uh, the Library of Congress. I thank everyone for coming today. I'm going to start by reading and performing one of my poems. I wrote this poem when I came to this country, and that's when I realized that I didn't know so much about the African struggle and the African-American struggle and the struggle of people for justice. So after I read and heard so much more about Martin Luther King because I didn't know about him when I was in Kenya, I was so moved, and I wrote this first poem. It's called, I Have a Dream. They say that I come from the dark continent, Africa. They say that I come from the dark continent, Africa. The last time I checked the word dark in the dictionary, it meant evil or wickedness uh, without knowledge or enlightenment, uh, a state of ignorance, uh, difficult to understand uh, the absence of uh, light. But I still believe in African. I'm proud to be an African because even though my continent has been marred by uh, civil wars, uh, ethnic wars, uh, tribal wars, and HIV and AIDS is killing my people in masses, uh, while the world watches uh, and the media shows with no remorse, please uh, do not let the media fool you because to them, uh, news is only when it bleeds, uh, it reads. But I'm not going to abandon my people and I am not going to disown my ancestors and no matter what they say, I am not going to deny my race. Instead, I have chosen to stand up for Africa. I have chosen to defend my history, protect my land, eliminate the, the perpetrators and their wickedness and declare peace in the name of justice. Let us not forget that Africa is the richest continent in natural resources from gold to diamond, rubber to copper, timber to oil. Africa is widely known for its uh, tourism industry. Africa exports tea, coffee, just to name a few. Africa is beautifully endowed with the Great Rift Valley, the Victoria Falls, uh, the pyramids, the oceans, the seas, and even uh, its uh, people. And now, 80% of the world's supply of coltan, a mineral that is used to manufacture cell phones and computers and playstations in the whole world is found in uh, Africa. Tell me. What darkness comes from all this light? Yet some of my people want to turn our blessings to curses, uh, letting their flesh control their spirit, making a brother kill his own brother, kill his own father, rape his own mother and his own sister in the name of money, power, riches, and fame. Why are we failing to see the big picture that if we stand up together, rid ourselves of all the corrupt leaders, we can attain riches beyond our imagination for we are already rich. And if we have to trade uh, let us not exchange our minerals for cheap change uh, while the Western world reaps all the benefit. Let us not exchange our minerals for arms to kill our own people. Who then will stand for us uh, if we cannot stand together for ourselves? 
is that let us exchange our minerals uh, for better machinery and technology so that we can become self-sufficient. And instead of depending on the West, uh, we can all work together. For if we let our selfish interests control us, some of our leaders putting our lives on the line just to fatten their big fat bellies, then we are saying that we did not learn from colonization and slavery. And it will be sad to say that history repeats itself. Why are we helping to build other nations and continents uh, while we watch Africa crumble and fall? I, I'm crying for a revolution and I, I'm searching for followers and I, I'm looking for peacemakers. And until we say that there shall be no more blood, no more rape, no more poverty on my diamonds, no more blood, no more rape, no more poverty on my gold, no more blood, no more rape, no more poverty in my oil, and no more blood, no more rape, no more poverty on my cell phone. We, as a people, need to stand up together and defend what is ours, fight for what is ours, own what is ours in peace and not in war. So just like Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream, I too have a dream. I have a dream that one day Africa shall lend and give aid to the world. Oh, yes. And I have a dream that one day we shall find the cure to HIV and AIDS and rid our continent of this dreaded disease. And I have a dream that one day our children shall teach the Western children our culture instead of it being vice versa. And I have a dream that one day all the African heads of state will come together, speak in one voice, and together form and create one country, one continent, the United States of Africa. So listen to our mother's calling. For when Mama Africa calls, we must answer. And I know that we shall get to the mountain top. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I want to do a uh, second poem, which is uh, from my new book. And uh, I wrote this poem because as a person, as an immigrant, I've lived here now almost 11 years. And uh, the ups and downs of life is very interesting. And we go through so much. And sometimes you just have to sit down and talk to yourself. And when you talk to yourself, you have to ask yourself, why are you afraid? What are you afraid of? Why? And uh, you just have to make sure that you can find the God in you. And from there say, I'm not scared of fear at all. So this poem is called, Find the God in You. I'm not afraid of you. Because I have seen your face a couple times before and you do not scare me. I've seen you creeping at my door, but you do not frighten me now. I have heard your roaring voice in the middle of the night, but that does not move me. I have seen you in my sleep, your scary face looking into mine. But this time, I am sleeping. I have met you on the roadside, but this time I am not running. And when you try to steal my thoughts, invade my peace, distract my mind and steal my joy, this time I will kill you. I will kill you because the last time you broke my heart, my spirit, my mind, and my body. And you stuck me into a cocoon because your plan was to reduce me into a fool. But I burst forth. My bubble has always been inside, not outside. So it never burst. And when everything was depreciating around me, I appreciated inside of me. Because I found wisdom and strength from within. And because a seed is the beginning of life, I am ready to grow. Even though you have handed me some bitter lemons before, I am the queen of the lemonade stand. Because I make lemons out of them lemons, baby. So now I stand empty, stripped of all my materialism. And indeed, less is more. I am learning to cleanse the body and fill the soul. For when I meet the angel of death, nothing will be spared but my soul. So go ahead. Strip, strip me of my nakedness, leave me bare, but this time I am not looking back, not stopping, and I'm not making any deals, but I'm marching into my peace with my soul as bright as the gates of heaven, for I have found the God in me, and I love her. Thank you. Um, I want to do this poem called Women of the World and Women of Africa, and uh, we are all so excited I know most of us are because yesterday a lot of women were elected into the Senate. And um, I tell you that women all over the world share the same issues, go through the same difficulties, struggles, and triumphs. And this is for all women. This is called Women of the World. Hello. 
As the flower of Africa blooms, so does a new day for the women of Africa and fold. From the time of her delivery, the African woman was known to be a liability and not a profit, a loss and not a gain. She was to be seen and not to be heard, to be abused, accused, humiliated and despised. Yet women of Africa and women of the world have evolved and transcended despite their hardship. They have survived inequalities, disintegration, physical, verbal and emotional abuse. Women of Africa Africa have survived carrying firewood on their heads, bags of food on their backs, a child on their breast, all at the same time while walking to the market, talking to themselves, for their voices were not to be heard. But still we rise. We rise because of women who paved way for equality and justice. Women like Wangari Mathai, the first African woman to win a Nobel Peace Prize. President Ellen Johnson, the first woman to be elected president in an African country. Mother Teresa, Eleanor Roosevelt, Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, and of course you and I. We rise because we wear many hats. We are mothers, teachers, politicians, managers, even soldiers, and still humble enough to be ideal deal wives. We rise because our struggles have made us stronger. Thus our backbones have not weakened but hardened to be strong as those of Cummins and still we rise. And so as we celebrate one another today I urge all the women to rally with one another as we face new challenges of HIV and AIDS, poverty, breast cancer and other underlying problems yet still fighting for proper equality and respect. Let us empower one another with no Knowledge, so we can help eradicate some of these problems, for knowledge is power, and lack of it is death. Let us empower one another through education, so we can teach both the boys and the girls the value of the girl child and her need to be respected. Let us empower one another through education, so we can teach both the boys and the girls the value, again, of the girl child and her need to be respected. Let us empower one another economically, so we can become financially independent, for we at the foundation of the home, without us, the house cannot stand. And even though our struggles still continue, let us not forget that we, the women, have already won the battle. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do, I think, one or two poems uh, from another poem from my book. And this one is called Those Aligned. And um, it's for many of us who have come to this country from other countries. And sometimes we just have to remind ourselves of how far we have come. And that not only as immigrants, but as human beings, we all have a purpose into the, in this world. We all are born and abroad here. God has used us and is using us for something bigger than we know. And sometimes we just have to find that out. And when we do, we have to reach out and reach in and reach out again to others. So this is called Those Aligned. There are no limits to our life. God created us in his image, in us with his power, and one who knows that is truly blessed. Our courage to leave the land and people we love in pursuit of education and a better life. Our open hearts to love strangers into life partners. Our wisdom to put our family first, nurture and educate them. Our vision never obscured, our goals never diminishing. We pursue the highest level of opportunities, never forgetting our elders' advice that God blesses a cheerful giver, that we should never forget our roots and to give diligently to the less fortunate. Now, taking on God's promises, for we are a God's testimony, the sky is our limit. And as we soar higher and higher, our charm, charisma, and faith will pave the way guide our tide, and joy will always fill our hearts because we understand and know that we are a gift to the world. Thank you. Um, before I come to the end of my performance, I just wanted to say again thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you dearly to Miss Bernadette for really honoring me by asking me to come and perform and be featured here tonight, this evening. 
Thank you to all the members of the Library of Congress. Thank you to, for all of you being here. Again, my mother-in-law, she cannot walk so well, but she made it through the stairs. Please give her a big hand. And uh, I just want to thank her for she supports me so much. And also to my husband, to my relatives, to my friends, and uh, to everyone who has just taken the time to come today. I don't know how to end this. I don't know which poem to say, but I just want to maybe say a poem about love because I really believe that love is everything. I'm going to do a poem in Swahili, and then I will translate it in English. Malaika, nakupenda malaika, namini fanyeje, kijana mwenzi yo, nashindwa na malisi na we, nige kuwa wa malaika. My angel, I love you, my angel. Oh, my angel, I love you, my angel. Na mini fanyeje, kija na mwenzi yo, na shinwa na malisi na we, nige kuwa wa malaika. Mapenzi ni kama dawa, kutibu magonjwa na uletwa na upweke na kuondoa simanzi. Leo hii ni na imani na nimeamini kuwa wewe ndiye mola kanipangia. Kwani miaka yote haya amepita na angali tupo pamoja na mwishowe tumekuwa bibi na bwana. Sikatai kwamba nilipo kuona kwa mara ya kwanza macho yangu yalipagawa. Nami nilishikwa na butana bumbuwazi kwa kweli nilikustaajabia. Nikapanda na hisia kwa ghafla kama sungura mjanja na kwako wewe niliganda kama gamu mtini. Na ijapokuwa mapenzi sio barabara ya mteremko kwani ina milima na mabonde na gamu huanza kuyeyuka jua linapozidi kuangaza nilipotaka kuteleza wewe ulinishika ili nisianguke na nilipotaka kupepea kama kipepeo uliwacha mlango wazi ili nisipotee na gamu ilipoanza kuyeyuka wewe ulikuwa kivuli changu na mwishowe tulishikamana kama pwagu na pwaguzi basi leo mimi sina wasiwasi wala sina tashuwishi kwani najua moyoni kuwa wewe ni wangu na mimi mi ni wako mpaka milele na kupenda mpenzi na kupenda na kupenda love is like medicine it cures all illnesses caused by loneliness and stress Today I have faith and I truly believe that you are the one meant for me. For many years have passed and we are still together and finally we have become husband and wife. Oh, the first time I saw you, I was mesmerized by your cool, impressed by your grooves, taken by your moves, rhythms erupted in my body like an excited rabbit. And I stuck to you like glue sticks to trees. And even though love is not a straight road, for it has ups and down rivers and valleys. When I wanted to fall, you caught me. And when I wanted to fly just like a butterfly, you left the door open so I could find my way back home. And when that glue started melting, you became my shelter. And together we stuck to each other like uh, two fools in love. So today I have no fear, neither worry, because I know without a doubt that you are the one meant for me and I for you. I love you, my love. I love you. I love you. Thank you. Okay, I hope this is working, yes. Um, my name is Eve Ferguson. I'm reference librarian for East Africa, and I have the pleasure today to interview Anna Morlago. Um, but I have to start with a couple of anecdotes about Anna first. Um, and uh, Anna and I go to a lot of cultural events, and I, of course I had seen her around. And uh, one day at the St. Augustine Church, um, African Diaspora Day, I saw Anna and she was standing behind a stand. And I said, oh, hi, how are you? Uh, it's good to see you again. And I said, oh, you know, I'm reference librarian for East Africa now. And she said, you need to buy one of my CDs. <laughs> so I said, I looked at it. The name of the CD was Kweli, which means truth in Swahili. And I said, yes, I guess I do need to buy one of your CDs, of course, for the library. Um, so I took my $10 and purchased it. And I listened to it and I said, well, you know, I'm not going to get my money back from the library, so I may as well keep it. <laughs> um, and I did. 
And from that point on, every time I saw Anna, she said, you know, when are you going to have me at the Library of Congress? And I kept saying, well, you know, we really don't have the money to pay you like you usually get paid, so it'll happen one day. Well, the day that it happened was November 3rd, 2008, when we had the Chinua Chebe program, uh, 50 Years of Things Fall Apart, and we had a drummer, Joseph Ngwa, come, and uh, we started the drumming, and next thing I know, there was a poet here, <laughs> and it was Anna. <laughs> and so I was surprised, I said, oh, I thought we were only having a drummer, but the poetry went on, it looked like it was part of the show, so we just went on like it was part of the show. Um, and the very next day, uh, of course, we're supposed to be very apolitical, and uh, Joseph and Gua started chanting, Obama, Obama, <laughs> which made it onto the webcast, and uh, the very next day, Barack Obama was elected. And so, uh, when we found out about this program, Anna continued to ask me over the years, when are you going to have me at the Library of Congress? And I gave her the same answer, and finally I started saying, when, when the time is right, then you'll be at the Library of Congress. And obviously today, the time was right because she gets to be the bookend. And now we have Anna here again, a daughter of Kenya, um, coming to the Library of Congress to grace us with her presence and her poetry on the day after Barack Obama was reelected as president. <laughs> so we're going to say it was, we'll give the credit to Anna for both the first election and <laughs> and for the re-election. Um, but of course, in Kenya, this is a very special time, and I'm quite sure it's very special to Anna being from Kenya, where Barack Obama is technically from, because in Kenya, you are from the country that your father is from. So therefore, he's a product of Kenya. And today, we have a very talented, and one more quick thing, and that is that the first poet that I interviewed was Susan Kaguli from Uganda. Um, who I met, and we realized that we were sisters from another mother. Uh, but we just found out because she had just come from Uganda. I've always known that Anna has been my sister from another mother um, for many years now, and uh, we've always operated on that. And so, of course, when I heard that uh, Anna was going to be the poet, somebody said, do you know Anna? And I said, um, yeah, I think so. <laughs> and so, of course, it, was, it is my pleasure to be able to interview Anna here today. Um, and of course, as I said, it'll happen when the time is right, and today the time is right. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to ask a number of questions which um, fall into, uh, into the realm of what we have interviewed previous poets about in order to uh, have an archive and a record of this that will go down in history. Um, so the first question I have for you, Anna, is when did you start writing and why did you turn to poetry? All right. Uh, thank you, Miss Eve. First, I just want to thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Again, I want to thank the Library of Congress, and I just want to thank God for making it possible. As I kept on asking, God knows the right time, and yeah. today is the right time. So um, I am grateful. I'm really, really honored. I can't even explain it. Um, I'm going to ask you answer your question first by saying, I started writing poetry when I was back in Kenya, and um, I believe I was uh, my second year of uh, high school, and I had a very good teacher, which is interesting because now he's actually in New Jersey. He teaches in New Jersey, and uh, yeah, he's my high school teacher. And um, he, um, he, we just, he, he, there were a lot of, I went to a boarding school. So the boarding school, there's a lot of extracurricular activities and different uh, groups and associations. So. I felt maybe I should join the journalism club. And the journalism club in Kenya, it's not about journalism as much, but more about poetry and all that stuff. So the first poem, uh, the teacher told us to write something about ourselves. And uh, after that, I just kind of like fell in love with poetry because every time we'd meet, we'd write about something uh, connected to our culture or connected to what you're feeling at that present moment. So that's when I started writing poetry. I think I was about, I would say, 15 or 14. And I, from then, I never stopped. OK. Um, you just uh, published your first book. I think we both have a copy of it in our laps, yes. Poetry in Exile. And um, 
specifically about the use of your term exile. How do you define exile and why did you use that word? Is it physical, cultural, spiritual, or what does exile mean to you? Well, uh, exile means a lot of things. It's spiritual, it's cultural, and a little bit physical, if you may use that term. But um, as many people or a few people know, when I came to this country, I came here in 2000. And um, I didn't know, I was very naive. I really didn't know that when you came, because I'd come to uh, California where I had been chosen to go for um, what's called the Arts uh, Media Workshop through uh, winning a national award in Kenya. So when I got here, I went to California, UCLA straight away, and uh, we had the workshop and everything. And when it was over, I went to New Mexico to stay with my cousin. Um, I didn't know that, you know, you're not supposed to stay longer. I just thought that, you know, I'll come, and then after a little bit, I'll go back to Kenya, and then, you know, I'll be coming and going. So, because I had a five-year visa, but um, nobody really told me this is what happens, these are the laws. So, when I came and I stayed in, uh, at, in, in, uh, at my cousin in New Mexico, of course, my, it's not the visa that matters, but it's something that's called the I-94. So, it did expire. And I, again, even when I left, a lot of people said, man, you have an opportunity to go to America. Don't come back, you know? So, <laughs> because they're like, you know, we're suffering over here. There's no jobs. You just finished college. So please don't come back. Just go stay there. So I was really torn. I wanted to go back so bad because when now I started counting the days and the years, things were tough. I mean, uh, you have to find a way of how are you going to um, get yourself to be documented when you are undocumented. And then what happened, I did try during the Clinton era, the last, last month, and I unfortunately, like many Africans, I got conned out of my money by somebody who really took advantage of all of us, many of Africans, and a good thing he's in jail right now because of what he did. But I still, I was going through so much. So uh, the first year went, the second year, third year, I can't go back home. I'm, I'm doing very jobs under the table and all that. And there's no way you can share this with any person because you are so scared. So I had to look into what? Writing poetry. So poetry was like my, if you can call it my therapy. I wrote so much about my experiences. I wrote so much about my home, how I miss my home, uh, my culture. Because coming to this uh, America, to come America, the culture is very different compared to our home. I always joke about how excited I was when I realized chicken here in America is so cheap. Hey! So I was like, you know, because in, in Kenya we have chicken for Easter and Christmas. So I write that in one of my, my poems because that was another part of culture shock. So anything I was exper experiencing as an immigrant, I used to write. So uh, with that, I wrote so much. Um, it was a form of a spiritual exile. It was a form of a cultural exile, physical exile. And we even went at the point where I had written over 100 poems. And I was like, this is time to go home. Nothing is good is coming out of this part of the world, and I've done my share. I was like, I'm packing up, and that's when God says, okay, hold up. I'm not yet done with you here in America, and I met my lovely husband right there, and uh, the story is continuing. No. But um, <laughs> the aspect of the fact that even when I went back home in uh, 2011, I was able to share my stories with them, my CDs, and they realized also the fact that I did miss them, they missed me, and that... We have to learn from each other. We have to be more educated about America and about the culture. Okay. Your new book is separated into five chapters. How do these chapters define the poems that are found in each one of them? How, wow, that's a good question. How do the poems define each chapter? Okay. Um, if I start with the first chapter about four souls and spirits. Uh, again, this book, I might say, I have to say, is just all my poems that I wrote over the last, I would say, seven to 10 years, and uh, it's experiences of losing loved ones, and that's why I have the first chapter for Souls and Spirit. It's all dedicated to our ancestors and people I have lost, people uh, that my friends have lost and have come to me and told me, can you please write something about this? And then the second chapter, Africa, my pride and joy, I always tell people that when I came to America, that's when I realized I was black. So... <laughs> Because in, in, in Kenya, we're all black, you know? So Africa, my pride and joy, I really realized my pride and joy when I, when I landed in, a, in, in America that I have to value my culture. I have to appreciate Africa and I have to elevate it because most of the things that 
people were saying about Africa here in America were very negative. All the things they see on TV, and I knew that I am a beautiful person inside and out, and therefore nothing bad comes out of Africa only. There are also good things. So that's my pride for Africa. My next chapter is my right, my soul, and my life. And here I just talk about the many things that as human beings we struggle with in terms of finding your way into this world. What am I meant to do? What is who, who am I? And writing, knowing your soul, knowing your right, and knowing your purpose. And then ups and downs of life, we all go through struggles in life. And that part of the chapter, chapter four, is about the struggles of all human beings. I write about my experiences, other people's experiences. And the last chapter is about love. And when it comes to love, everybody here has experienced love. Mama's love, Baba's love, Papa's love, sister, and relationships. So I write all about love in my, next, in my last chapter. So it's, it's broken that way for a reason. Okay. Um, how do you see the relationship of poetry to dance and song? Well, I just feel like um, dancing is a form of poetry, just that no words are being used. Because if you um, learn more about African dance, you know that there are dances for each occasion. There are funeral kind of dances and songs. There are celebration, weddings, uh, different initiations. So when you dance a different dance, you're saying something through that movement. So for me, I think dance is definitely uh, related to poetry. And of course, songs. Songs, music, uh, the words are definitely poetry. And uh, to me, um, some people love to sing and hear music. Some people love to hear other people perform or just say poetry. So in this, they're all tied together. Okay. Can you describe the contemporary poetry scene in Kenya and how you relate to it, especially living over here and not being a part of that culture on a daily basis? Well, I must say when I came to, uh, to, um, to the United States, when I left Kenya, we were not really, because I was in the theater scene, uh, I was at the National Theater, I am also an actress, and I used to do more of acting and more of dance. Uh, there was very little poetry, but it was coming up. Uh, then we really didn't have so many of our spoken word artists as we have nowadays in Kenya. And um, also we, we knew about the poems we read in high school, uh, our famous, uh, Chinua Achebe, who was here before, we knew about them, but we didn't really have the young people coming up and really claiming poetry as, or spoken word as a powerful tool for the arts. But now more and more people um, are relating to that. And I think one of the reasons is because through poetry, you really come out strong and share your feelings. You speak for the masses, and that's a beautiful thing. So for us, or for me right now, I can tell you that in Africa, or in Kenya, it's more about relating their issues, issues of justice, human rights, just like it is here through poetry, and it's getting better and better. Okay, and I guess that gives me um, an opportunity to plug your second CD, which is called Haki, uh, which is justice in Swahili. Um, can you tell me, uh, you write some of your poetry in Swahili, a language which is long associated with the poetic form. Um, how do your English poems differ from your Swahili poems? And do you translate each one of them from each language? Um, I think uh, first, uh, we all know that poetry for me it has been about experiences, what I've gone through, love, uh, relationships, uh, ups and downs, struggles and everything. So when I write a poem, Sometimes I can choose to write it in English or in Swahili, just because I want to probably connect more to an African audience or to a Kenyan audience or to a Swahili audience, or sometimes just because that's how the spirit says, write it in Swahili. So I write it as I, as I am told. Uh, sometimes also people come to me and say, can you write me a poem? So when people request for me to write something, I ask them, how do you want it in English or do you want it in Swahili? And whatever they tell me, then I do that. So for me, sometimes I write in Swahili like my poem, uh, Mapenzi, the one I just performed. I wrote that poem because I have two friends who are getting ready to get married. And a friend of mine said, can you write them a poem? And they are Kenyans. And I said, if I write it in English, it won't do it any justice. But if I write it in Swahili, it will be perfect. Because 
it, it'll just, they will, sometimes when you are native speakers, sometimes you get something more in your native language. So that's why I wrote it in Swahili. Uh, some, they, I have a poem about coffee, and I wrote the poem in, in Swahili called Kahawa in Swahili, it's coffee. And it's because I know that uh, coffee is uh, one of our main, uh, what you call it? Export. Export, yeah. So I just wanted to share that with uh, the, the, to be proud of where I come from as, an, as a Kenyan. And also, at lastly, when you say about translations, I do translate some of them, but not all of them. So some of them, I just leave them as is. But uh, if somebody needs a translation, I can definitely do that. OK. Um, where do you, as a, well, let me just backtrack a minute, because I know that a mutual friend of ours once asked you to write a poem in Farsi. Um, I don't know how that went. I guess we'll find out <laughs> at some point. Where do you, as a poet and performer, fall in the broader context of current African literary trends? Where do I fall as a... I don't know how I can explain that, because um, at this point in our lives right now, we, we know of our forefathers and our ancestors and our older um, elders, like Chinua Chebe Ali Mazurui, who wrote about, uh, and uh, Wole Soyinka, who wrote about the struggles of uh, Africa through their work. And also, not only that, but also fictional work, some of them did that. So for me, I try to merge both of them, the struggles, the justice, uh, the peace, the love, with also aspect of just um, dealing with day-to-day -day, uh, lifestyle. So I cannot say that I am, as that's why probably some people will call me Mama Africa because they think I have an old soul, which I think I do have an old soul. But at the same time, I also uh, want to work with the young at heart and know what are their struggles and write about that. So I am a contemporary artist, but at the same time, I'm not shy to say that I'm an old soul. I can, I, I can go back there and grab something from my elders and use it because it's all about sharing and passing a message. Okay, and my last question, um, and I just wanted to preface it a minute to say that, you know, a lot of us know that in Kenya in particular, there are a lot of rappers coming out. Uh -huh. uh, and a lot of people are doing rap music. Um, and how do you see Kenyan and African poetry in comparison to Western spoken word and print poetry? And can you talk a little bit about the importance of the DC literary community for you? Yes. Um, let me start by talking about the DC literary community. And I have to share the story that um, when I came to America and then when I ended up landing in, you know, staying in uh, Virginia, Maryland, D.C. area, I really, because I, ha I, am, I am an actress first, I said, you know, I'm going to go to the studio theater and I'm going to audition. So I'll go there and they will look at me with my heavy accent and say, oh, you did such a wonderful job, but we don't have something for you right now. So... <laughs> But I never, I never, I never stopped. But I just used to go. I, they can tell you, I have so many African-American friends and uh, also just uh, other, other people who are in the community as artists who seen me growing up as an artist here in D.C. because they, I was the only African or the only immigrant in a group of people who were doing auditions, uh, whether it's uh, called regional auditions where they used to call all these theater companies to come and audition the people. I was the only one. Uh, and when I stumbled to spoken word and poetry, it was amazing because I think I got tired of being, uh, what's the word, uh, being, being told I can't do a part because of my heavy accent, you know? I was tired of that. I'd knock from one door, audition, get my headshots ready, do my research, and they'll just, if not, they'll give me a background part or tell me I'll, to be a nurse, because that's what they know Africans to be. <laughs> so I, I said to myself, okay, I have to find a niche. I have to find what's going to work for me. And believe you me, I don't know how, but I just thank God for stumbling into spoken word. And when I stumbled, I was, I think, in, on, on U Street. I just went to one cafe, and I had people doing their poetry and reading it, and so many of my uh, people I didn't know, and I was like, wow. So all I need to do is memorize my poems, and I can be on the stage because once an artist, always an artist. So if, if, they, if they denied me there, I had to go and knock at another different door. That was my thing. 
So I said, okay, I went home, and believe you me, I just started memorizing, because I was an actress, and as actresses, you memorize all of your work. So I was very good at memorizing my poetry. And when I memorized it, and the, the second time I was at, on U Street, at one cafe, and I went there, and I started doing my poem, and everyone was like, who is this? Because guess what? The words were good, but it's my accent. They were like, wow, we've never heard of an African poet. So the African-American community, the young poets, I remember friends like Kimbe, uh, Kaniki Jakarta, E-Baby, all. It was a group of so many of young poets, artists. And uh, they just encouraged me. Every time they'll call me, hey, we're doing an open mic. You want to come? So I would go. And then one time we did a big show of all the poets in D.C., uh, African-American and black poets. And uh, it was a show of, it was a play, but you, you talk about your poetry. And that's when I met the whole group, and they really built me up because they encouraged me. They were like, we need you. So anytime they have anything about Africans or they want to know more about Africa, I was the only lone voice, and they would call to me. They would be like, Anna, we need you. And so I'm thankful to them so much because even right now we still communicate, we still work together. And then at the same time, the fact that now I have a book and I have two CDs, I think now the message is not only for, for African Americans, it's for all Americans, white or black, and also for my immigrant community, which have always looked for somebody to share their views, and I'm glad to do that. The other question was um, to do with uh, the rappers in Kenya as poets and here. I think um, I've always said that whenever I've been interviewed that um, our language as uh, we speak Swahili as our national language is a perfect tool. So number one, I don't, I'm glad they're using mostly Kiswahili to rap, and that's a good way of doing it because we still want to remain strong with our African and our cultural her heritage. At the same time, I don't think that if they want to go to a worldwide audience, they should rap because I always say that rapping, Americans are the best at rapping. So you can still use your voice, your words, but do something that is make you unique, like what I did with spoken word and sharing and talking about Africa. So if they can probably, let's go back to the Afrobeat mo movement, the music, the rumba, let's do that more so that now we can bring it to this side. Because as much as we have the rap in Swahili, if it comes here, they'll say, oh, they're rapping, oh, in English. But if we can sing in Swahili, if we can do much more using our language, but in a different way, not aping the Western way, then we can be able to bridge the gap and we can be able to do even much better. Okay, um, I just wanted to add a little footnote. You talked about eBaby, Eric Smith, uh -huh. who is also one of our Library of Congress employees over in the African, Latin American, Western Europe uh -huh. uh, cataloging division. So we have a, a lot of hidden talent in this library. Yes, yes. I also wanted to add, speaking of hidden talent, that um, Anna is also a comedian. Uh, um, and uh, if you ever have an opportunity to hear her tell jokes, she will definitely have you roaring and rolling. Um, Thank you. So we hope that one day we will see her on the Africa channel. I think the show is called Africa, Africa Comedy. Yes. Or yes. Africa Laughs or something like that. So hopefully one day we will um, see her doing her comedy because, you know, it, it really is uh, something to behold. I want to thank you very much for coming to the library. Very shortly on November 17th, um, Anna will be leaving the United States for a while. She'll be traveling to Morocco. Actually, November 12th. November 12th, okay. So just in a couple of days, she'll be taking off. Uh, going to do a women's conference yes, in uh, uh, Morocco. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, also going back to Kenya. Um, I want to ask uh, about your concerns for your native country as they head into elections next month. Uh, that's, a, that's a powerful and a very good question. Uh, I'm very concerned because, as you know, right now we did have, when we had our election in 2007, there was a little bit of violence. Uh, we are really hoping that this year, I mean next year, there will be no violence. And I think that what, what can help us to make sure that that violence is not there is, number one, the leaders in my country recognizing that they have to listen to the voice of the people. Uh, because a lot of the leaders, is, uh, they are a little bit, I can, be, I can tell you that, it's all about themselves and uh, 
what they want to get out of the government. But the voice of the people on the ground is that they need leaders who are not corrupt. They need leaders who are not going to be, um, who are, don't have a case on the, at the ICC. They need leaders who are, are ready to govern, not for corruption, but for the people. And so it's really important for the leaders in Kenya to listen to the voice of the people. And if they do that, if they, uh, the young and the old, especially the young, because there's, in Kenya they're saying uh, our highest population is the, young, is the young adult. So we really have a voice if they listen to us, if they can do the right thing by the people, not by themselves, then I think our elections will be successful and uh, we will not have any violence. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. We wish you safe travels. Uh, we wish you a wonderful time at the holidays in your homeland. And we wish that you will have healing words for the people of Kenya when you get back there and she will return next year in 2013. So please look out uh, for Anna uh, around town and uh, around the world. And uh, I wanna say thank you also for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, Eve, uh, Bernadette, Mary Jane, everyone for being here. Mama Susan, this is my friend for a long time ago. She's uh, one of my hustlers, if I may say so. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she, uh, she helps me in so many ways. And uh, everyone who is here, I just want to say thank you to all people who have helped me since I came to this country, strangers, relatives, loved ones, because if it wasn't for them, truly, I wouldn't be here today. I, again, I just want to thank my relatives. I, my mother-in-law can wave her hand. She's right there. And my husband right there. And my aunties over there. And all my friends. All these are my wonderful friends. I just want to say thank you. I also wanted to share that you did have a small reception so that they don't go away yes. after this. <laughs> yes. Because oh, I don't want them to go and we leave with all the cake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, also it will be a way of celebrating my birthday. My birthday was November 4th. Oh, yeah, happy birthday. Three, day, three days ago. <laughs> and uh, it's just an honor to be here when, uh, after my birthday when President Obama wins his second term. And uh, I'm just grateful and I'm so thankful to God and to all of you for being here today. Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to invite you back to have some tea, Anna. We actually have a cake. Okay. So uh, we will celebrate your birthday. We invite you to come back and uh, talk with Anna, mix and mingle, have some tea, cake and cookies in our conference room back here. And thank you very much for coming. Yes. Yes, we do have books okay, and good. CDs. Okay, thank good. you very much. Thank and you. Please come with us uh, into our conference thank room. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.